Well, I wish I can write on the uh, screen. Uh, I'll do this. In that market, fix that market. This is about how much they are charged. If they have a triple A credit rating, they will get paid, they, they will be charged 5%, a little bit high, a little bit high this interest environment. And triple B will pay about 7%, 2% difference. We saw a percentage difference between triple A, triple B, and a uh, treasury bill, right? Uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, module for a uh, PowerPoint a slide. Now this is a difference. So what's the uh, difference between a triple A, triple B charge in fixed market, 2%. Variable market, variable debt market is a short term. And because lender is not stuck with borrower for 20 years, 30 years, it is three years, five years rolling, rolling debt. Therefore, they are charged much lower. Triple A will typically pay T minus 0.25, and then triple B will pay T plus 25. The difference is charged here in variable market between two credit rating is 0.75%. So if you subtract 0.75 to 0.2% here, 1.25 is so-called arbitrageable difference. One point two five, we say arbitrageable difference. You can share this one point two five between a triple A and triple B and save interest cost. We'll see who gets how much of this. Now, if you look at here, swap agreement is this. My original obligation with bondholders stays safe. You have to honor this. This bondholder doesn't know about this derivative contract because when they invest a bond here, fixed long-term bond to triple A company, they were promised to get paid 5% annual interest payment for next 20 or 30 years. They don't care about this. So their obligation to original bondholder here, note holder or bondholder here, and triple A 5% stay. It's just between two management, A, two management, A agree to exchange their A interest payment. Okay, now, according to swap agreement, this agreement, the rate they agree, has to be between triple A, triple B A interest rate. Otherwise, if this is the higher than 7%, triple B has, uh, doesn't have any incentive to do this swap contract because they must pay less than 7% and they must get it, they must get it uh, uh, the uh, 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 more than more than a, a T bill, otherwise a swap will not work. In other words, you, in order to save, you gotta pay less than market rate. So if you look at here carefully, how much triple B will get? Well, this is a cost. They have ob original obligation of T uh, the uh, T. So this is a triple B. Original obligation is T plus 0.5. That's T. Another obligation, swap payment, 6%. 6%. 2% swap out. They are getting T from whom? Triple A swap out. So this payment you are getting will reduce your in, uh, cost. How much is the net cost for triple B firm? T plus 0.5, 6 minus T? 6.5. 6.5%. How much they have to pay if they go to fix the market directly? 7. <clears throat> How much is their net cost through swap transaction? How much they said? 0.5%. Saving. 
stay being full to be productive. 0.5%. You just know who people who know it. Billions of billions of dollars of debt, adding up to about 20 billion. Let's say that is total more more than 20 billion for any typical Fortune 50 company. Now, 10 billion. You save annually 0.5%. How much we are talking about? 50 million. 5 million. 50 million. 50 million. 55. This is a point <coughs> over 5. Yeah, 50, right? 50, right? Yeah. Let's do this one. Triple A for Triple A. Now, they are paying a 5%. This is the cost. Their original obligation to their bondholders. <coughs> but uh, another cost, they have to pay TB2 for a partner. But how much they are getting? 6%. So net cost is how much? T minus one. T minus one. Okay. Now how much they have to pay <clears throat> T minus one, right? How much they pay uh, when they go to variable rate market? T minus 0.25. But net cost is point T minus uh, T minus one. How much they are saving? 0.75. 0.75, 0 0.75. So if you add 0 0.5 and 0.75, that is arbitrageable differences. They are sharing this arbitrageable differences between triple A and triple B. Then how come triple A saves more than triple B? Look, you are doing swapping this interest rate swap payment. How come one guy saving more than a, for the same transaction? Why this guy saving more than this guy? It's safer investment. Hmm? It's a safer investment. Yeah, this one, this one is taking risk by dealing with lower rating firm, right? This guy, they don't have any risk, right? <coughs> Other than this transaction. Therefore, if that is a saving, triple A firm must be compensated for taking another risk by dealing with low credit rating firm. <coughs> That's why most swap prob swap contracts will give a more savings to triple A firm, higher rate rating firm. So if a firm gets the re re-rated lower, they're going <coughs> to well, that's why, see, most of them, this is a 20-year loan, 30-year loan. As you saw from Home Depot foot, uh, footnote, swap agreement is five years. Median uh, length of the swap agreement is five years. Every six months, you have to reset your swap contract. In other words, every six months, you calculate gain position, loss position, and settle this a swap payment and receivable with a, a, the, the other guy. So uh, uh, if bond rating will go down, you have to rewrite, you have to rewrite swap contract. So this is all contingent upon current, current a credit rating. Triple B firm is getting how much? TB. And they are paying a six percent. Six percent is for sure. What if T bill goes down to zero, like this? Ah. They don't pay much. Zero credit bill, almost zero, risk free. When they sign contract, uh, it was two three percent. At least they can cover part of this. Now, so I contact financial institution and say, look, I am getting <coughs> treasury bill payments from the other guy, but this will work as long as T bill is about 2%. If T bill goes lower than 2%, why don't you take over that a, a risk? Uh, I will sign with you interest rate flow contract. Flow contract. 
flow. This is the flow that I can go. Below that, you take over that risk. If this goes down 1.5, you pay 0.5% to me so that I know at least I will get 2% payment from two apartments. This is an interest rate flow contract. Remember, swap agreement is coming from bond payable. Bond payable. So this bond payable is a notional product. Out of this notional product, we derive one financial product, which is interest rate swap contract. That is a derivative. So this interest rate swap contract is the first derivative. Flow contract is the second derivative. If you have want to have option on this, that's the second derivative, third derivative. For triple A form, you know, what if this goes up to seven, eight percent? In worst case scenario, but you are not gonna get that in your lifetime. I like that. Five, six percent, seven, eight percent. It could happen. It happened twenty years ago. You know, right now I can pay two percent. If that goes up to three, four percent, I'm not sure whether I I make any money out of this. So I have to cover my stuff. So I am a signing ceiling contract. Interest rate ceiling contract. That's their third derivative. I am covering myself. Look, up to 3% I can pay. If TV goes more than TV, uh, the 3%, you pay. I'll give you minimum a, a fee, nominal fee, for five years. You are purchasing insurance policy with financial institution for your a derivative. <coughs> this area of financial statement became a complex ever since 1980, early 1980s, because uh, Wall Street has been uh, introducing this uh, financial derivative to a cover your a loan, a, a debt, and this is this market swap market is uh, bigger than uh, options and futures market combined right now in terms of notional product. Trillions of trillions of notional product trading every day. You know the other guy needs a variable, the other guy needs a fixed. That's fine. Then you can <coughs> differentiate. What if you have to do this and then you don't know anything, which is the case for most people? That's when you contact Goldman Sachs. Merrill Lynch. Bank of America. If financial institution comes in between you here, Goldman Sachs, they charge slightly higher fee to triple B than triple A. Why? Once again, they are dealing with risky client as opposed to safe client. The saving here will be reduced because this guy will make money between these two parties. When that product was introduced, few years into that product, uh, I was curious. Um, so I called uh, Salon Brothers. Uh, they are not here anymore. Salon Brothers. Um, they used to occupy World Trade Center 7. At the Twin Tower, on the side, World Trade Center 7, which is the 42nd, 41st floor. The Solon Brothers were using those two, a small Twin Tower there. 
and obviously 9-11 to uh, not be treated with us. So I made an appointment. Uh, graduate student, <coughs> 1989, 1990. And then I called him up and said, look, I'm writing this big paper. I need to talk to someone who knows bond product and we decided enough. Who are you? I'm a graduate student. And he finally uh, let me talk to a bond manager and she said, look, I charge you um, $3,000 for a uh, 30 minute conversation. Bond PhD student. I want to write a dissertation, so I need to talk to anyone who knows this product. I'll give you 10 minutes. List of all the questions and see me. When I arrived at the uh, front door, uh, there was a name tag, and then uh, asked me to go to four, uh, 41st, 42nd top floor, and um, I realized uh, that the, uh, she's the bond manager, a PhD from Chicago, CPA, CFA, back then, was uh, CFA was a uh, very rare commodity, but now about 400 employee bond department was, were reporting to her. And I realized that I had a really good chance to talk to her for free. So I write down all the answers, 10 minutes up, she said, why don't you go to conference room? There is, there is a gentleman waiting for you and he will explain this, all this derivative product up to this point and answer your question. I came to conference room, this young face, employee fresh out of college, economics major, were talking to me like foreign language. He didn't even uh, pay the, uh, you know, like, like a foreign language, speaking foreign language, throw all the diagram, making sure I understand this, and uh, wish I had an uh, iPhone back then. No, I mean, <laughs> this is busy uh, you know, writing and uh, economics major from South Mountain. Just, just brilliant gentleman. Uh, and that was 20, 25. Now, the product here, the as you can see from here, third, fourth, and fifth derivative out of this notional product. And original bondholder has no clue as to how many times they, uh, the derivative product came, came out of this notional product and who holds this. This is exactly what happened in 2007. Mortgage, pay, mortgage payable. They slide this mortgage receivable with a structured investment vehicle, SIF, and they sold options and futures and all this. By the time they realize original mortgage payable is more than mortgage asset, it collapsed. House of the cards collapsed. That's exactly what happened in 2008. For this, I don't know. If something happened here because of the uh, derivative they drive here, some that if you look at the magnitude of that a uh, the uh, uh, debt from financial statement of a major corporation, well, we only, only saw the uh, Verizon hundred more than hundred billion dollar debt. Mm -hmm. all, all of them swapped. And I'm sure there will be derivative after derivative based on that. Mm -hmm. Question. It has a domino effect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It's one thing, uh, it, it, the original source is not stable. Yeah. Four, five, six, seven, a derivative out of this product. Is it, is this kind of related, given Goldman Sachs, is, is that kind of like what went on between Goldman Sachs and AIG with the collateral party payments? Yeah, well... Is, um, it, is it like this? Is this no, on? see, see that's, a, that's another domain because okay. um, uh, that's... Uh, well, Goldman Sachs, I mean, 
you would love. It's like an insurance they took out with AIG on, mm -hmm. on the mortgage backed security. So they said, well, if they go bad, we'll pay it. See, that's, uh, that's different than this. Yeah, this is a uh, bond payable, and that's another notional product, another notional product here. And I think they are doing sim something similar to a Malaysian uh, uh, government official, and they are in deep trouble right now because of the <coughs> And, and, and it's illegal and legal and, and, and uh, cyborg comment. They were kind of in, in London, they were kind of messing with the cyborg. There was something a couple of weeks, months ago where they were, there was some kind of collusion with the going on in the library. One trader, brilliant, a mathematician, um, a brilliant guy, early 30, in his early 30. Uh, he was so brilliant in the London market that they say he, he, Somehow influence libel yeah. libel rate, and not British government. U.S. government is suing him, and he, I think he, uh, uh, his last uh, verdict was uh, several years in jail. Several years. Yeah. You mess with people here. Libel. I mean, that's you know. that's the analogy. You see, this is the. Uh, in this case, our case is civil. Yeah. Most of them transatlantic deal would be libel yeah. plus this. And he was able to influence this by structurally uh, programming the transaction between these two parties. Brilliant mathematician. That's why so many mathematic majors in World War Street these days. <laughs> Understanding finance is never enough. Evil genius. <laughs> so, so that that the, the manipulation of life was uh, the uh, well, that's the 2000 what uh, eight nine. Now, U.S. Uh, authority finally uh, were able to indict him, and U.K. court sentence to be several years in prison. Mm -hmm. Any question on this before we move on? To This is uh, not an option anymore because once you see once you once you see this uh, annual report, well, as you saw from a Home Depot, this is a typical financial system. Two notes, interest rate swap, cover going over second pages. So. Uh, Uh, last week uh, we were kind of uh, well we'll go, we'll go today we'll see finally a uh, case uh, and examine uh, how they manipulate a uh, financial statement from real a company we talk we look at a piecemeal basis uh, up to this point, but we'll see some broader scale of financial reporting, questionable financial reporting, uh, from recent financial data. Before we do that, let's Well, all on the revenue accounting, well, we, uh, uh, <coughs> we did the um, uh, percentage of completion problem. Uh, well, Toshiba is having trouble with the percentage of completion, right? Toshiba. Mm -hmm. And we did uh, on, on, uh, the uh, percentage of completion on, on the revenue uh, uh, accounting. And I believe we are here uh, operating <coughs> R&D and restructuring. This is one big area of a great area of accounting because, first of all, uh, this is the area where we see most differences between U.S. GAAP and IFRS. Uh, especially R&D and restructuring. This, uh, it's 
not comparable even between US GAAP and a IFRS, and we'll talk about that uh, as we uh, go through uh, this story. Um, R&D costs are expensed as incurred. That's a fancy number, 2973. When APB was replaced by FASB because APB was too slow in making uh, accounting rule, and people were impatient. SEC and this Congress, uh, GAO, they all complain about Look, we don't have any debit and credit, and worst case is years ahead. What are you doing? And so they replaced APB with FASB 1973. First thing they did was this account. So number one was a uh, conceptual uh, framework. So R&D account, 1973, FASB number two. The idea here is this. We know R&D is an asset. Because unless you invest in R and D, you are not going to buy. Mark spend five billion dollar, about five billion dollar R and D every year. Most part, if not all of them, not all of them, but so a significant portion of five billion dollar will be successful R and D. They develop patent and develop drug. Otherwise, they wouldn't survive. Year after year. So it must be an asset. But, as we said, we don't know what percentage of $5 billion will be successful expense. Why? Because we want to produce conservative finance. Why conservative financial statement? Well, conservative financial statement because Right away, R and D extent that will suppress your net income here. And if you look here, a balance sheet, as we saw, and R and D asset, uh, asset, R and D asset will not be recorded here. A here because of the net income extent, net income decrease, uh, your retained earnings will go down. So they balance this way, pressing down their a income statement and balance it. They press down. That's why it is conservative. So that's the a consistent with a whole idea of a, a, a conservative financial reporting system, which is has been starting from what, 1929. Ever since 1929, whatever if there is a choice, lower. Lower income, asset, lower expense, liability, upper bound. When in doubt, choose lower income, low expense. When in doubt, choose higher liability, higher expense. That's the that layman's definition of liability and conservative. From 1980s. Group of accounting faculty collected research evidence. R and D is an asset, and start pressing fast to change this because it is not comparable with international financial reporting standard. Because IFRS treat R and D most of R and D as asset, as opposed to expense. It's not comparable. If you have some CBRE overseas, you can combine one to one because one is an expense treated uh, uh, income statement, the other uh, asset treated income. So, <laughs> Professor Lab, still in NYU, Stern School. Um, one of the most a, a significant influential accounting faculty in terms of research. And he uh, he sends out a memo to all accounting faculty. Look, if you have any evidence, um, why don't you send me uh, your research evidence so that I can march into FASB and press this guy to uh, change this account. So my attempt to uh, try, I try to answer. Um, 
I certainly understand. I certainly understand because the other uh, research I did with one of my colleagues here is whenever CEO is 
in danger of losing their job, the first target is RME. They cut out RME. They don't have to report anything. They just cut out R&D advertising and a maintenance expense and promotional expense. Why? If you reduce the expense, that will increase income. Increase income, EPS goes up. You, can, you might survive a shareholder meeting. That's why they cut out discretionary costs. Journal of Management and the Corporate Government are coming up. Took us seven years. So I certainly understand this is really a uh, very subjective and gray area of our kind, but uh, that does not justify uh, treating 100% of the R&D as an expense because all these high-tech pharmaceutical companies spending billions of dollars for R&D and you simply treat all the R&D as an a expense? Could you could you look at this? I, I think it's software expense. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole statement in the beginning is that the market spending a lot of money to develop a revenue stream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So could the way the chance is going to answer would be say at some point our R&D is likely to produce mm -hmm. a result. And at that point, we classify debit from an expense to an asset. Good, 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 good. In other words, uh, Michael has a good point. In other words, uh, here... Um, so it's becoming viable. Use that term, right? See, uh, software, you develop software. At this point, uh, you see economic feasibility right here. Ten, few years, millions of dollars, but at this point, you can document Actually, there is economic feasibility with this a software development. All the expense up to this point, expense, all the expense here, a asset capitalization here. This is a software accounting, the FAS88 software accounting revised recently. So, uh, according to my suggestion, for R and D, why don't we use the same approach? At some point, when you know you will get patent, you're gonna get, you're gonna get a pipeline, yeah. and and then and then you uh, start a capitalizing all the expenditure with respect to this other problem with that approach. You know, for typical R and D, it's ten year project. More corporation will spend billion dollar here. They collect the sample develop research a model and a, uh, all the uh, research and then once you have a formula you will test on limited uh, animal subject general animal subject limited human subject population documentation get an approval from FDA for this tenure, most of the tenure process, FDA can send you one email. We are not comfortable with your documentation number XYZ. Stop that process. They can stop this process right here. That, that's how uncertain about this process. Until you get majority vote on FDA here, there's no guarantee that you will have paid it. That, that is a, a quite different from here. Good a idea though. You know? At some point, if we know. Because you get the benefit from that in the future. I of course, otherwise they would survive for years. Yeah, years and years. Good point. Incidentally, if you work for a company and you develop a patent, it's not yours, it's the company's. If I work for Mark and I develop a patent, my contract could have said it's a Mark patent, not mm -hmm. Michael Bush. I develop right? a, uh, <laughs> I develop online content. I can use it. This a platform belongs to Rutgers. Yes. Okay. Uh, we published this uh, article on the how to do or increase audit efficiency. At the University of Minnesota, when I was there, they paid three thousand dollar to five year patent. Yeah, to their and point. that's their product. 
I want the honor to put my name <laughs> on the, uh, the my CV, uh, my name with the patent number. That's all. No, to the point. You know, they're, they're giving you all the facilities to do the research, though. Of course, of course. Um, so, so R and D. Before we start R and D discussion, uh, this is how a uncertain. Um, Cost of our prior credit R and D expense include uh, R and D effort as well as cost incurred in connection with certain licensing arrangement, and these are following phase B number two. Phase B number two, nothing but following phase B number two. Uh, uh, for R and D, if you have uh, what research part, hundred percent a expense. Development part, if you have this building for this uh, research activities, this can be capitalized if you can use this building for another purpose. If you are testing a radioactive material here, after R&D, you have to take this down, you can capitalize. Even this is a, this is a building. So there are a lot of a of uh, Exceptions and give different rules about here. Uh, Pfizer spent 7.9 out of 59, so that is a magnitude. A, almost 8 billion, 2011, 2012. Uh, R&D expense ratio for this. Here, 13, 13, 14. Oh, not this way. 14, 13. And Bristol Myers Squibb, 18, 18, 22. How come Monk is reducing their R and D here? Is Abbott the same is the same and Adelie is a increasing? This is a huge decrease. Increase, pay, slight decrease, but pay. What is this monk? How you explain this? Without knowing their history. What would be the reason why you can clash and still successful without looking at their financial? Boosting EPS and uh, writing up. You have your patents mm -hmm. to guarantee revenues. Oh, okay. And then you just, um, so again, like you just mentioned, just boost your EPS while you have guaranteed revenues coming in for the next couple of years. Next couple of years, okay. Uh, once you develop a drug, how many years of a patent you have? In other words, exclusive right to purchase that drug. Patent. How many years do you have to get a patent? 20? 14, somewhere in there? In between? Somewhere 20. in there, right? 17. <laughs> 17. Uh, I know they keep on, but that's the thing. It's um, in some other context, I was looking at something. I think it was actually in the textbook in one of the footnotes it said, you know, with expected patent expiration of yeah, a particular date, yeah. but they keep on filing suits to try to extend it as long as possible. So I know it's a fixed amount of time, but then they can... Yeah, well, um, in the uh, uh, patent rule says uh, you have exclusive rights for 17 years, and then, yeah, you, you, you engage in that um, lawsuit to defend your patent. Depends how many others are in pipeline, pipeline. You look at R&D portfolio, how many of them will be will hit the market for the next few years. In this case, my guess is instead of using R&D, R&D to produce patent, they are using this because they did merger and acquisition. They acquire company with patent. See here, uh, remember, I remember Mark spent billions of dollars to uh, number fourth or number fifth, um, number five pharmaceutical company from a, a UK because they have a portfolio of patent. So there are two ways. Either you develop or buy company with patent. And this is the case.
See, <coughs> just uh, here, for every $100, $14, for every $100 revenue, $14 is R&D. To me, that's a lot. So to me, this industry, yeah. Uh, well, different rule under IFRS. Uh, most of the R&D, most of the R&D will be capitalized. So most aggressive a uh, accounting in terms of uh, capitalizing R&D is Japan. Japan IFRS allow most of the uh, research and uh, development to be a, on a balance sheet, capitalized asset. That's why you have a Japanese subsidiary, you have a major discrepancy between U.S. Uh, gas-based uh, financial statement as opposed to Japanese IFRS financial statement for this one and modern acquisition. Two uh, countries are using a different uh, concept. R&D by Cisco. Cisco, yeah, we, we here, uh, that'd be a lot of money for a total mm -hmm. revenue of 48 billion, 5.4, almost 6 billion dollars. One eighth, 5.5%. <coughs> what kind of research R&D activity they might have? Cisco. A pharmaceutical we know, I mean, developing drug. Cisco, how, how, where, where they spend this much of $6 billion for their R&D? Look at their product. And guess where they spend this much of money. Tech. This is a major portion of their R&D. Right, yeah. oh. See, that's speed and easy access. They, uh, they have almost exclusive a, a domination on this route <coughs> all over the world. They use, they have to use Cisco. Same from San Francisco. Stanford problem. This was the uh, Stanford University internal university uh, a service hmm. trying to give a access to wireless this and they saw this huge opportunity outside. If world can use this wireless computer in years, and that's when they hit the market and now that is the Cisco. Stanford does a lot of big things about six phone by Google. <laughs> you know what I mean? Out of Stanford. Out of Stanford. This yeah. is a, now, I, I tell you, a Stanford MBA program dominates now, now ranks much higher than Wharton, Harvard, and everyone else because they focus on tech. It used to be Wharton because every, everybody was focused on Wall Street Finance MBA. Tech MBA dominates now, and that is. One of them is uh, Google, one of them is this, and keep coming out from that place. Uh, Third point, 12%, 12.5 or 12% of the sales, R&D. See, this is interesting. It, it will be for every, um, this, uh, this, uh, these are discretionary costs. Discretionary. And these are discretionary. Well, amortization, well, pretty much, you know, you have to follow. Uh, discretionary. General and administrative, well, you have to pay uh, wages and all this, uh, any other expense. This one is CEO is in trouble, top manager is in trouble, he manipulates Whenever you hire new manager, first thing they do, spend as much as R&D here. Why? Nobody will blame you for the next few years. You have a honeymoon period when you share with So if you invest maximum here, you have much more discretion to increase income next year, year after year. So your tenure will be good. Research after research, they show this. 
Um, those alternative views, you have to have alternative views. If this is a, again, re you know, chemical radio radioactive uh, research, you have to take this down building, you don't uh, capitalize it. Uh, housing lab, capitalize. Any other asset? Building? No. It must be a, no alternative use, must be a expense. Uh, R and D cost uh, uh, for wages and general cost of PPE accounts as uh, they normally you know, uh, any other cost. Expensing of PPE with no alternative use is uh, capitalizing depreciating R and D is not an uh, advisable depreciation amortization period is arbitrary. In other words, U.S. GAAP general rule they don't give a discretionary measurement of internally developed assets. So they don't count internally developed intangible assets. Goodwill will be developed internally and you increase the firm value, but that will not be on balance sheet. Whenever you pay premium to outsiders, there's the objective evidence of you pay premium, that will go goodwill, but that's not real goodwill. That's not real goodwill. I mean, See, this one is, is similar to good. In other words, good, what is the good? I mean, we know good is, uh, good is uh, premium. You pay to acquire this company. You pay, you pay the money uh, minus uh, fair value of asset. You know, the market value of that net asset. Net, net value. In other words, over and above the market value of the firm, you pay premium, and GE Fortune 50 company pay premium billions of dollars, and they go to balance sheet. But what if you develop goodwill internally? You know, goodwill would be extra earning power. Definition of goodwill is actually extra earning power. No potential for generating extra earning. That is the definition of goodwill. But we never use this for a capitalizing goodwill on the balance sheet. If there is the objective evidence of paying premium when you acquire target, then you should, because this is objective and you can manipulate that amount. There is the evidence of a payment, there is evidence of market value of the firm. This is the problem. Well, I guess uh, they, they, they can't trust. Uh, if they allow this, then uh, financial statement will not be so objective because this is pretty much how much you want asset, how much you want equity. Uh, I can certainly understand that. And one area of this, another a monkey area is this. Uh, Restructuring. This is uh, uh, what uh, the SEC previous uh, SEC uh, chairman said. The prime target for cookie jar. Asset write down. Employee. Uh, whenever you uh, downsize, employee civilians and relocation cost. Uh, now for this, if you you say. Uh, restructuring expense here. Restructuring expense and here credit will be contingent liability. Contingent liability. Employee severance and relocation uh, uh, cost. You don't know now. This is a multi year execution of merger acquisition, downsizing, <coughs> eliminating a, some part of the uh, division. So you are talking about multi year project. So you have to estimate. And 
as of today, contingent upon outcome of certain events. So this is contingent liability, and you say restructuring expense. And this is, if, as you see from financial statements, multi-million, multi-billion dollars for a, a fixed firm. Now, and this, this can happen also asset write down. You writing asset down because future expected cash flow from that asset is lower than fair market value of that asset. Once again, future expected cash flow from that asset is lower than fair market value of that asset. Then you have to write it down. And how much is the future expected cash flow? Management decision. So that is contingent upon realization of a certain future event. This was, let's say, uh, 100 million, 100 million. Uh, this was when this happened, employee dividends and relocation costs. This happened this year. And typically, this happens with M&A, modern acquisition. It's not your fault. It, it, you, it, once you consolidate your business, you have to terminate some part of the operation, and you remove your a, uh, asset, and a certain percentage of employee will, will let go. So, so, so M and A and M and A and asset write down, asset write down, and new management, new CEO is coming in. Um, typically, this is the case where you see you see a contingent of uh, the uh, this restructuring uh, uh, charges and. Hence, this will build up your cookie jar. Yeah, taking big bath will give you huge replenishment. Replenishing your cookie jar will come from a taking big bath. So, the deep assessment, hmm? right? The mm -hmm. deep assessment, you got this big credit, the union liability, mm -hmm. not about the same. End of the day, all this stuff is done. So the actual cost, the actual cost is going into the union liability. Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, he's got a credit there, <clears throat> and everything's done. So now, where does this credit go? Oh, see, <laughs> this know. is this yeah. is the only one event. Yeah, that's, that's why they all, all for the future they are keep replenishing their cookie jar yeah. with another event, another event, because your ongoing operation source of a cookie jar is not limited to one source. You can have any other event. Oh, 2008 when everyone uh, as was. Uh, having a liquidity crunch, 80, 85 percent of S and P 500 took restructuring because they play macroeconomic events. Oh, rightly so. So macroeconomic event like that will give them another chance to replenish their cookie jar. So when overall market conditions are poor, mm -hmm. pad. The restructuring expense. In other words, they are not going to blame certain managers. Sure. Or rest it. So, <laughs> so you pad it then, and then also if you're having above expected returns, if you're beating your forecast, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you could also take a little bit and pad it that time too. To, you know, rainy day. In other words, as long as I don't get the blame for that expense treatment, right. they will do it. Now, let me reverse new, new, new manager. Yeah, like, you know. I hear what you're saying, but in other words, you're smoothing your earnings, right? In a sense, because you're taking your expenses and making them. So you're saving for a rainy day? Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, this is it, this is it. The credit side of this thing, does that ever come out? Yeah, um, yeah, next year. I mean, do you ever raise the cookie jar? Yeah, next year. <laughs> you <laughs> next year. You reverse it. Yeah, you, yeah, you reverse it. You say, I'm going to credit my hinge in your Next year, right. after mm. you record this, next year, you say, uh, sometime in November, oh, I. I'm sure of ten million dollar target income. Where do I get ten million dollar target value? So wait a minute, I am cookie job. <laughs> so what they do is, oh, you know what? Last year, uh, I said we set aside ten a hundred million dollars. That was overly passive profit. Oh. Huh. Too conservative. 
Too conservative. So why don't I do here this year, December, you say contingent liability, 10 million credit expense, 10 million. What this credit 10 million expense will do? Your Reduce your expense, Reduce increase pre-tax income, and how much you put here is exactly how much you need to post target income. That's why right now, right now in cookie jar, uh, out of a uh, hundred, they use 10, 90, right? They draw down, they draw down, and something big happened. You replenish your cookie jar, adding another hundred or million dollars. IBM, IBM from their cookie jar released nine years of this. And why this month, nine years amount is different? Because that's how much they needed to meet the target income. 19, 89, 19, late 19, uh, 80 to uh, mid 1990s. Watch out. It's not e as easy as I described here because now you have detailed documentation required. For example, in footnote, you have to explain <coughs> how you got this uh, 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 the uh, restructuring or, or cookie job, how much of the continual idea how you your assessment of future event you have to document clearly but still you have almost free discretion as to the size of the cookie job and as to how much you release i mean if you have a multinational corporation there are many, many excuses to create <laughs> this a, a restructuring target and then replenish your a uh, uh, <laughs> let's take a break and when you come back we will keep talking about it.